God, come to my assistance. Lord, make haste to help me. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. Recordatus misericordiae sue, 
Sicut flor cutus est ad patres nostros. Abraham et semini eus in secula. Gloria patri et filio et spiritui sancto. Sicut erat in principio et nunc et semper. Et in secula seculorum. Amen. Beata es Maria, que credidisti, perficientur in te, que dicta sunt ti. Let us pray with confidence in the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Father, your love for us surpasses all our hopes and desires. Forgive our failings, keep us in your peace, and lead us in the way of salvation. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now and forever. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Who made heaven and earth. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Salve Regina. Mater misericordiae, vita dulcetto, et spes nostra salve. A te clamamus, et sulet spiri heve, a te suspiramus, cementes et This evening we will be meditating through this Lectio Divina upon some of the most beautiful of the Psalms, the Psalms of praise, the Psalms that speak to us of the majesty and the glory of God. There are many such Psalms in the Book of Psalms and the Psalter. Certainly the last few Psalms end off in a burst of praise. And Psalm 29, which is very appropriately used on a Monday morning in the Divine Office, is a great psalm about a thunderstorm. 
seeing the majesty of God in the thunder and the lightning, which we find in the book of Psalms. A storm coming off the sea, giving a vision of the majesty of God. And that is something, in a sense, that we find in this psalm, the psalms we're looking at this evening. Psalm 8, Psalm 19, and I'll take a little peek at Psalm 104 as well, because that's also a psalm that speaks to us of the majesty and the beauty of God in creation. Now, you'll notice that I'm using a big book. Um, this is a very big book, which with my eyes is a good thing to have. It's called the Abbey Psalter, the Abbey Psalter. And the Psalms, so this is basically the Grail Psalms. And this is the Grail Psalms as well. It's just easier to put this in the pocket than this. Um, this is the Psalms in Hebrew. Uh, this book here is the Psalms, the Grail Psalms in the revised version. It's a little bit um, tuned up. Some of the slight inaccuracies in the Grail Psalms are corrected here. And this is one that has some wonderful commentary as well. I get this, the Abbey Psalter comes from the Abbey of the Genesee, a wonderful monastery, a Trappist monastery, about three hours from here. And I try, well, when we could get across the border with well, before COVID and the pandemic, I would try once or twice a year to go there and spend a little retreat. It's a wonderful community of Trappist monks. And one of them, I guess, many, many years ago, did the whole of the Grail Psalter in calligraphy, and then it was reprinted up, and that's what they, they use in their prayers. I remember once I was speaking with them, and they were wondering whether they should tune up a bit and go to the more slightly corrected revised form, and I, it might improve the accuracy by, I don't know, 5% or something, but I thought, well, I don't think we probably need that for the chanting of the Psalms. They've been praying these Psalms for decades, and um, the, the very thought of going through all this and correcting it would be a bit too much to reflect on. So when we pray the Psalms, we encounter God. We encounter ourselves, we encounter many things, but we encounter God in every one of the Psalms. But in some of the Psalms, we especially encounter the beauty of God in nature. In other Psalms, we encounter God through the word of God, through the sacred scriptures, through the law of the Lord that is sweeter than honey from the honeycomb, through the Torah, the word of God speaking in history to his people to guide them on the right path. And so we have the God of nature, God reflected in nature, and God speaking to us in the law, in the Torah, in the instruction, the teaching that guides us. Both are the same God. It's not like there's a God of nature and a God of the law. It's the same Lord. And in fact, in Psalm 19, the first section is a psalm speaking of the beauty of God in nature. The second section is the law of the Lord. So I'm going to go a little beyond what's printed up in the program. I'm just going to keep on rolling when we get to Psalm 19. Um, and uh, because some people, how can one psalm have two very different sections to it? Well, God speaks to us in nature and also in the law. And so those are two ways we encounter God. Very appropriately, in the divine office, the Psalms of nature, where we see thunder and lightning and stars and moons and things like that, as we do in Psalm 8, these are found usually in morning prayer. In fact, uh, Psalm 8 is found on Saturday morning. The Psalms of the law, including the big long one, Psalm 119, which was the longest chapter in the Bible, goes on and on. It is broken up into pieces as is the second part of Psalm 19, and it is found in midday prayer. In midday prayer, when we're the middle of the journey of the day, we have the Psalms of the law of the Lord that is sweeter than honey from the honeycomb to guide us through the day. And we have the Psalms of the journey up to Jerusalem, to the city of God, as we're going through the day. In the morning prayer, we usually have the Psalms of praising God in nature. In evening prayer and night prayer, just before we go to bed, we have the Psalms in which we trust in God, the God, our refuge and our strength. God, our creator, God, the giver of the law, 
God, our refuge and our strength. I'll just simply read a little bit of Psalm 104 before we begin the Lecture Divina because it's just such a beautiful Psalm. It's a very, very long Psalm, so I'll dip in and out of it. But it just has wonderful images, which we'll pick up a little bit in Psalm 8, of the beauty of God in nature. And so here's just a little bit of it. It's just really, really beautiful. Bless the Lord, my soul. Lord God, how great you are, clothed in majesty and glory, wrapped in light as in a robe. You stretch out the heavens like a tent. Above the rains you build your dwelling. You make the clouds your chariot. You walk on the wings of the wind. You make the winds your messengers and flashing fire your servants. You founded the earth on its base to stand firm from age to age. You wrapped it with the ocean like a cloak. The water stood higher than the mountains. At your threat they took flight, to the voice of your thunder they fled. You made the moon to mark the months, the sun knows the time for its setting. When you spread the darkness it is night, and all the beasts of the forest creep forth. The young lions roar for their prey and ask their food from God. At the rising of the sun they steal away and go to rest in their dens. Man goes forth to his work to labor till evening falls. So it's so beautiful. We have the lions roaring at night. They're going back to sleep during the day. At the same time, man is going forth to his work to labor till evening falls. How many are your works, O Lord? In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your riches. There is the sea vast and wide with its moving swarms past counting, living things great and small. The ships are moving there and the monsters you made to play with. So beautiful. Sort of Moby Dick as a rubber ducky there in the water, the great waters. There's God playing with the great monsters of the sea. It's just beautiful. It's magnificent. So this is where we see the glory of God reflected in his works. And in the many ways, the greatest of the Psalms that speak of that are Psalm 8 and Psalm 19. So let us prepare now to experience God through the beauty of the book of Psalms. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord, help us to hear your word to meet you in the words of sacred scripture, before which we come with a humble heart. Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. Take away from within us those things that are barriers to your coming in the word of God. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. Psalm 8. How great is your name, O Lord our God, through all the earth. Your majesty is praised above the heavens on the lips of children and of babes. You have found praise to foil your enemy to silence the foe and the rebel. When I see the heavens, the work of your hands, the moon and the stars which you arranged, what is man that you should keep him in mind? Mortal man, that you should care for him. Yet you have made him little less than a god. With glory and honor you crowned him gave him power over the works of your hand, put all things under his feet, all of them, sheep and cattle, yes, even the savage beasts, birds of the air and fish that make their ways through the waters. How great is your name, O Lord our God, through all the earth. How great is your name, O Lord, our God, through all the earth. As in Psalm 104, which I just dipped into a little bit, 
the heavens proclaim the glory of God. We see in nature God's presence made manifest. We think here perhaps of St. Francis of Assisi, whose famous canticle, he did not say glory be to brother sun and sister moon. He sometimes mistakenly thought to have said that. No, no, he knew the moon and the sun were just objects. He said glory be to God for brother sun and for sister moon. It is the things in front of us that make manifest the glory of God, but we do not mistake them for God. Sometimes people have. People have worshiped the sun and the moon. People have worshiped creatures, as we see at the very beginning of the letter to the Romans, the first chapter, speaking of those in that ancient time, in the time of the Roman Empire, who worshiped various uh, animals and things like that. In the book of Isaiah and throughout the Old Testament, we see people worshiping the works of our human hands, worshiping nature. In a sense, that still happens. Some people worship nature. They never think of themselves as dancing around the temple in ancient times, but all they can see is nature. They cannot see the creator of nature. How sad they fall so short, sort of not quite making it off the runway to begin the great journey. Amazing, sad. I was just reading today an image used by a scientist about the people who are rather limited in that way. Imagine a scientist who dropped a net into the ocean, deep, deep, deep to the deepest levels of the ocean. It had had three inch wide netting in it. He pulled up a great catch of extraordinary sea creatures but made the conclusion that there's nothing smaller than three inches in the bottom of the ocean because he didn't find any in his net. And yeah, that's of course not true because he just didn't have the capacity, he wasn't finding, he didn't have the tool, didn't have the way of finding what was there. And so it is for people who do not recognize the, the instruments, the Hubble telescope, things of that nature, can show us the majesty of God, reflected in nature. They cannot photograph God, but they show the reflection, the beauty of creation. And from that, we can be led to reflect upon the creator, as St. Paul says at the beginning of the letter to the Romans. I think too of the great poem by Francis Thompson, In No Strange Land. He lived long before people could see the great galaxies spinning around in vast distances of space, all those things we get through the Hubble telescope. But he has a beautiful line of, not where the wheeling systems darken in our benumbed conceiving soars. The drift, the drift of pinions, would you hearken, beats at our own clay shuttered doors. We can, the sense of God's presence comes to us in ways which are beyond nature, but which are reflected in the glory and the beauty of nature. So how great is your name, O Lord our God, through all the earth. Your name, the name of God. Sometimes in the Jewish tradition, because they do not wish to speak the sacred name of God out of reverence, they simply call him the name, Hashem, the name. And that's why we, in our own life, we reflect upon that. The name of God, in a sense, is God made present in revelation in the world around us. The name is God made present in his works. How great is your name, O Lord our God, through all the earth. We know how a name is important. We call people by name. We make a personal encounter with a person through a name. We think of the holy name of Jesus, how important that is for us and why we are hurt when people take that name in vain. And so here we begin. How great is your name, O Lord our God, through all the earth. Your majesty is praised above the heavens. On the lips of children and of babes, you have found praise to foil your enemy, to silence the foe and the rebel. Oh, the marvels of God's creation the sun and the moon, the stars, all these great things, the heavens, 
through all the earth, how great is your name, praised above the heavens. And one of the things for which we can give great praise is a great gift of creation, as stunning as a spinning galaxy way off in the distance, are the lips of children and of babes. A marvel, a little child. I remember there was an atheist who once just looked at the ear of his daughter, a little infant baby daughter, and seeing that wonder of complexity and beauty, began his journey back to a recognition through that of the existence of God. Your majesty is praised above the heavens on the lips of children and of babes. The very gift of children and of babes. You have found praise to foil your enemy, to silence the foe and the rebel. And as the little children begin to speak, the very gift of language is as marvelous as the sun and the moon and the stars. When I see the heavens, the work of your hands, the moon and the stars which you arranged, what is man that you should keep him in mind? Mortal man that you care for him. The psalmist goes outside and in a world where there were no lights to distract, and looks up at night. Oh, amazing, wonder. When I see the heavens, the work of your hands, the moon and the stars which you arranged, all of this has order to it, which itself is as wondrous as the beauty of the objects out there. When seeing that compared to that, to that majesty above the heavens, who is this puny little creature looking out <laughs> into these galaxies way, way beyond? And they saw something beautiful when they looked up. They saw a big dome with lights in it, which is beautiful. It's what we see if you walk outside in the countryside when not a lot of lights around. You look up, you see a big dome with lights in it. And that's beautiful. Of course, we now can see beyond that because of the technology of telescopes and things like that. It's even more beautiful. We see photographs taken of things we could never imagine to see with our naked eye. When I see the heavens, the work of your hands, the moon and the stars which you arrange, the photos of deep space from the Hubble telescope, what is man that you should keep him in mind, mortal man that you care for him? We are so small. And that's good for us to think about. We shouldn't get too arrogant. Think how small we are in this great universe. Here we are on the third rock from the sun. Not a particularly impressive star as stars go. Just little old us looking up. So it's good for us to be humbled before the majesty of God made manifest in creation. And then there is a turn. Like a train going down the tracks, pull the switch, goes another way. Sometimes see that with the streetcars in Toronto. Yet, oh, there's gonna be a change. Watch always in praying the Psalms for a word like that. Yet, we're just, we're just nothing. Yet, you have made him little less than a god. With glory and honor you crowned him, gave him power over the works of your hand, put all things under his feet. For all of our smallness, in the context of the universe, yet, we have been given a dignity which is itself majestic. You have made him little less than a god. After all, this little puny creature is seeing all of this, thinking about it, capturing it in the mind, creating now as they did not have then, they just looked up, creating as we do now, missiles that go off into there, explorers going deep into space, 
We're made little less than a God. The trouble is, though, we think we are God. That's the problem. With glory and honor you crowned him, gave him power over the works of your hand. Put all things under his feet. We have a responsibility, as we see in the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis. We're given the garden to tend it, not to own it, not to suck it dry, but to tend it, to be stewards of creation, the creation over which we have some influence. All of them, sheep and cattle, yes, even the savage beasts, birds of the air and fish that make their way through the waters. Wow, that's amazing. Although we are so small and compared to this great universe, God gave him power over the works of your hand, put all things under his feet, all of them, sheep and cattle. But that's not too impressive. Sheep and cattle, that's domestic animals. Yeah, we control those. Yes, even the savage beasts. When you think though the whole scope of the responsibility of humanity, and then more than more extraordinary than sheep and cattle, birds of the air, whoosh, off they go, and fish that make their way through the waters. And in the Old Testament, the waters are dangerous, the waters are chaos. You don't control the waters. The fish of the waters, and the thing they call that was joking about Moby Dick in Psalm 104, but that's a very good thing to remember. We don't control the waters. It would have been good if the captain of the Titanic had got that through his head. We don't control the waters. In fact, at the very end of the Bible, in the book of Revelation, when finally all is brought to perfection in the heavenly city, there shall be no more sea. The sea, which is a symbol of chaos and harmony reigns finally. But here we are in this world, we have sheep and cattle, savage beasts, birds of the air, fish, including whales and things which they would have considered fish. It's in Jonah, it's a great fish that snatches Jonah. And there, talk about the sea, the little boat bouncing up and down and you know, danger, help, we're gonna die. Or think, in the, think of the New Testament, the boats bouncing across the Sea of Galilee and the Lord usually coming to his disciples, walking on the waters. And who can walk on the waters? Only God can walk on the waters. Only God controls chaos and says, let there be still, and the sea is stilled. All of them, sheep and cattle, and even the savage beasts, birds of the air and fish that make their way through the waters. How great is your name, O Lord our God, through all the earth. This is the same line as the opening line, and, and often in scripture we have a kind of a sandwich pattern, an inclusion it's called, where we begin and end with something in the middle. And yet it's not the same, though the words are the same, because when we hear how great is your name, O Lord our God, through all the earth at the very beginning, that can just be a you know, nice thought. How great is your name, O Lord our God, through all the earth. That's a kind of a pious thing to say. But after we have seen <laughs> the mouths, the lips of children of babes, praised above the heavens, the heavens, the work of your hands, the moon and the stars. And yet you've made him little less than a God, glory and honor, power over the works of your hands, sheep and cattle, savage beasts, birds of the air and fish, all piled together. Wow. Then when we say it the second time, this, this same line is charged with electricity, <laughs> just sparkling with understanding and insight that we have gained, because this time it's not the beginning of the psalm, we've got the whole psalm we've been praying. And we get to it again and we see how profound it is. How great is your name, O Lord our God, through all the earth. Wonder, wonder. That's the pathway to wisdom, is to have a sense of wonder. It helps, certainly. 
I think G.K. Chesterton once said, the world is not lacking in wonders, it's lacking in wonder, in the spirit of wonder, to marvel at God's creation, to marvel at even the beauty of human creation. And so appropriately here in this cathedral, and it's not done accidentally, the ceiling is blue with stars. The ceiling of this cathedral, as in the ancient tradition, says, when I see the heavens, the work of your hands, the moon and the stars which you arranged, what is man that you should keep him in mind? Mortal man that you care for him. Because when you come into this church, we are coming to adore, to worship our Lord, to hear God's word, but we're also reminded of the beauty of natural creation and the beauty of artistic creation. Beauty, truth, goodness, the three great transcendentals, the pathways to God. How marvelous this is. Amazing. Well, the next, the other Psalm I want to meditate on this evening is similar to Psalm 8 in some ways. It's about beauty, creation, seeing God and marveling. It's probably originally two different Psalms, but they've been put together for a long time. They, they've been split in the, the breviary, in the divine office. The first one, which is sort of like Psalm 8, the first part of Psalm 19 is much like Psalm 8. It's talking about the beauty of nature. And like Psalm 29, which talks about a thunderstorm, boom, 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 coming off the sea. you have seen the glory of God. Like Psalm 29, it may well have originally been a pagan psalm that has been, I don't want to say baptized, but has been brought in and made, given a deeper meaning of faith. So that's the first part of Psalm 19, which is what you have printed in the, the program. And right immediately they go, boom, into another thing. It sounds so totally different. A whole bunch of things about the law of the Lord, the rule of the Lord, the precepts of the Lord, the command of the Lord, the fear of the Lord, the decrees of the Lord. All these things are the same thing. It's just taking the diamond of God's law, his Torah, his instruction, his guidance, and praising it. More to be desired than gold, the purest of gold. Instruction, so in them, the law, the rule, the precepts, the, the commands, and so on. Your servant finds instruction, great reward in their keeping. But who can detect all his errors from hidden faults acquit me? From presumption, restrain your servant, let it not rule me, then I shall be blameless, clean from grave sin. May the spoken words of my mouth, the thoughts of my heart, win favor in your sight, O Lord, my rescuer, my rock. And there we end off with two images of God, dynamic, the rescuer, diving in. Yeshua, this is the rescuer, that's the name Jesus means the rescuer and the rock. Two powerful images. Always when praying the Psalms, look for the names of God. But it's just like a 90 degree turn, like that. Uh, you know, what do they do those, um, you see in gangster movies, the bootleggers turn the car, like that. <laughs> but halfway through this Psalm, you go from the beauty of God, like in Psalm 8, to the law, the law, the law. It's a whole difference rhythmic pattern, but it probably shouldn't be split. And I probably was wrong to have only done the two nature parts, the two nature psalms, glory creation psalms, because really the God of creation and the God of the law, it's the same Lord God. And in fact, we marvel at the beauty of God in creation. We come to a personal relationship with God in the law of the Lord, the teaching, the revelation, it's not the force be with you. That's several levels down. You could, if just reading Psalm 8 or the first part of Psalm 19, think of nature as the force. Some people, as I say, worship not the God who gave us nature and wonder at God by seeing the works of his hands. They worship the works of his hands. Not much future in that. So here's Psalm 19, and I'll just run it right to the end. And if you have a Bible, just, I mean, I should have a Bible, I hope, or maybe a, a grail psalter, you can follow along. 
and uh, I'm sure they'll be able to find uh, uh, captions and things when this is finally put on television. The heavens proclaim the glory of God. The firmament shows forth the work of his hands. Day unto day takes up the story, and night unto night makes known the message. No speech, no word, no voice is heard, yet their span extends through all the earth, their words to the utmost bounds of the world. There he has placed a tent for the sun. It comes forth like a bridegroom coming from his tent, rejoices like a champion to run its course. At the end of the sky is the rising of the sun. To the furthest end of the sky is its course. There is nothing concealed from its burning heat. The law of the Lord is perfect. It revives the soul. The rule of the Lord is to be trusted. It gives wisdom to the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, they gladden the heart. The command of the Lord is clear, it gives light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is holy, abiding forever. The decrees of the Lord are truth, and all of them just. They are more to be desired than gold, than the purest of gold. And sweeter are they than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. So in them your servant finds instruction. Great reward is in their keeping, but who can detect all his errors from hidden faults acquit me? From presumption restrain your servant, let it not rule me. Then shall I be blameless, clean from grave sin. May the spoken words of my mouth, the thoughts of my heart, win favor in your sight. O Lord, my rescuer, my rock. The heavens proclaim, they speak, just as the law of the Lord speaks the will of God. Nature speaks to us as we look up, as in Psalm 8 we look up, and Psalm 104 as well. Nature, in a sense, speaks to us. We just need to interpret it. That's why if we think nature is speaking to us as God, we're, no, not quite. The heavens proclaim the glory of God, and the firmament shows forth the work of his hands. Day unto day takes up the story, and night unto night makes known the message. The story is of God's graciousness in giving us creation, including the firmament, which if you look anyone in 580 BC or 2020 or 2021 and whenever, you look up, what do you see? A light blue dome in the day and a dark blue dome at night. That's the firmament. Now we know we've got telescopes, we've got developed our science and things like that. We have satellites whizzing around. We know that in fact, there's not a big dome there, but that's what it looks like and that'll do. Like if you look at a rose, you can analyze it to the molecular level, but you don't see the rose any better than if you have it in your hand. And then you have it in your hand, you see a flower, which actually is perhaps maybe more beautiful than seeing a bunch of little things the heavens proclaim the glory of God. Firmament shows forth the work of his hands. Day unto day takes up the story. The night unto night makes known the message. No speech, no word, no voice is heard. Yet their span extends through all the earth. Their words to the utmost bounds of the world. Nature speaks, creation speaks to those who have ears to hear. And so does the Lord God to those who have ears to hear. The word of the Lord who comes amongst us indirectly to the beauty of creation and directly when he came amongst us at Bethlehem. There he, God, has placed a tent for the sun. The sun was worshiped in Egypt and a lot of other places. The sun was worshiped, so powerful in the sky, bringer of life, bringer of heat, bringer of everything. Also feared, if you're living in a desert land, the sun can kill you. So it's, uh, you know, it's like the sea, beautiful, majestic. It can kill you too. So, so it's powerful. And because powerful was worshiped. But notice here, God places a tent for the sun. Again, it's not glory be to brother's sun and sister moon, it's glory be to God for brother's sun and sister moon. Got to get that straight. It comes forth like a bridegroom coming from his tent, rejoices like a champion to run its course the sun going across the sky. 
At the end of the sky is the rising of the sun. To the furthest end of the sky is this course. There's nothing concealed from its burning heat. This is the daytime psalm of creation. Psalm eight is a nighttime psalm of creation. The moon and the stars, here we have the sun. All of them speak without being able to be heard as a voice. No speech, no word, no voice is heard, and yet we see the beauty of God in creation. And we thank God for that. That's one of the reasons why praying the Psalms is so refreshing. Gets us out of all our petty concerns and brings us to wonder. We're called, if we pray the divine office and wish to do so, feel free, you can get the books anywhere. <laughs> you can do some of it, all of it, much of it, whatever you like. We lace our lives with beauty and wonder. And I tell you, as grim as things are these days, that's not something to disdain. Oh my, when you're struggling, slogging through the valley of tears, dealing with all the stuff this very forgettable year, the one, the you unforgettable know, one we want to get, uh, get out of, so much going wrong. It's, I think we need an oasis that refreshes us and also a mirror that gives us an understanding. We find both in the Psalms. So we end off with this beautiful thing. There's nothing concealed from the burning heat of the sun then. But what is even greater gives us rescue and rock and help and all of that. The law of the Lord is perfect. It revives the soul. The rule of the Lord is to be trusted. It gives wisdom to the simple. And boy, sometimes we can be simple. We need wisdom. Wisdom, be attentive. Let us not be fools. The precepts of the Lord are right. They gladden the heart. A preceptless life is hell. To think we have freedom means I can be myself. You're a lonely little island if you think that. No, there's order in creation, order in life. We come into harmony with that and we find peace that passes all understanding. Isn't it amazing that freedom, freedom of everything these days is considered to be something just wonderful. Lots of suicides, anxiety, terrible affliction coming upon us in our society. I think maybe you could say at the end, hello, you know, yes. If we live a life of unbounded freedom in this way that lifts us out of the order of creation, we're not gonna find happiness or peace. We're gonna find anxiety and depression. The loneliness that comes, the thinking freedom and dignity mean to be autonomous. Me, myself, and I, that little island. And that island is depressing hell. Look in Dante's Inferno. Nobody's singing in hell because to sing we must be together when we're all cut off in our own little iniquities or when we are proud of our independence. For all pride, and sin both have the little letter I, that most deadly of letters, in the middle of them. So the precepts of the Lord are right, they gladden the heart, joy. The command of the Lord is clear, it gives light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is holy, abiding forever. The fear of the Lord means reverence and awe for God, not being afraid of God. The decrees of the Lord are truth, and all of them just. Good old John Henry Newman was wandering around in the fog but he found truth. He always sought it. He was confused for a while, but then he found it. And finally, at the end of his long life, the great St. John Henry Newman put on his sort of his, his epitaph from shadows and illusions into the truth. The truth, of course, will set us free. We must know that, for that is wisdom. And in wisdom, we find peace. They are more to be desired than gold and the purest of gold. Sweeter are they than honey and honey from the comb. Order, majesty, God's plan and 
that is sweet. It's not constricting any more than the lines on the road constrict us. They just prevent us from hitting one another. They allow us to get where we need to go. So in them, the precepts of the Lord and all of that, your servant finds instruction, your great reward is in their keeping. No need to have the rules if we don't keep them. But who can detect all his errors from hidden faults acquit me? Humility is kind of important. From presumption restrain your servant, let it not rule me. Pride is the killer, the illusion that I got my hands on the steering wheel of history or of my own life. Then I shall be blameless, clean from grave sin. May the spoken words of my mouth, the thoughts of my heart win favor in your sight. O Lord, my rescuer, my rock. And so with all the majesty of creation, the clarity and life-giving order of the law of God, we end off with shalom, with peace. This is very similar in some ways. Just read Psalm 29, which very appropriately in the office is on a Monday morning. It's a Psalm of the thunder that ends up, storm coming off, the beauty of God in creation. And then it ends off sort of like Psalm 19 in peace. Sort of like that, you know, the Beethoven, I forget what symphony is, we have boom, but boom, but then it ends off in peace. So, there we are. Wow, this is so beautiful. The Psalms, what a gift of God. So I encourage, pray the office, some of it, any of it, much of it, whatever you want. You can get a little, I think I showed you last time, a little morning and evening prayer or night prayer or do the whole thing if you want. The whole nine yards, just take your pick. You don't have to chant it from a big psalter like the monks do, but they do it, you know, right through the night. They do it in the evening, early in the morning and, and go through the day. So here we end off with this. Let's, first of all, Psalm 8, the beauty of wonder at God, shown manifest in creation, how small we are and yet, so that's the humility. But then how great is our responsibility and how great is the name of God who has given that to us. And in that we find our dignity. And then Psalm 19, the beauty again of God made manifest in creation. But then that further gift, which is the gift of him speaking to us directly to tame our angry hearts, to give wisdom to our proud souls so that we may find God, our rescuer, our rock. We find our way home through this stormy sea to the haven that is heaven. How great is your name, O Lord, our God, through all the earth. Your majesty is praised above the heavens on the lips of children and of babes. You have found praise to foil your enemy and silence the foe and the rebel. When I see the heavens, the work of your hands, the moon and the stars which you arranged, what is man that you should keep him in mind? Mortal man, that you care for him. Yet you have made him little less than a God with glory and honor you crowned him, gave him power over the works of your hand, put all things under his feet. All of them, sheep and cattle, yes, even the savage beasts, birds of the air and fish that make their way through the waters. How great is your name, O Lord our God, through all the earth. The heavens proclaim the glory of God and the firmament shows forth the work of his hands. Day unto day takes up the story, and night unto night makes known the message. No speech, no word, no voice is heard, yet their span extends through all the earth, their words to the utmost bounds of the world. There he has placed a tent for the sun. It comes forth like a bridegroom coming from his tent, rejoices like a champion to run its course. 
and the end of the sky is the rising of the sun. To the furthest end of the sky is its course. There is nothing concealed from its burning heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, it revives the soul. The rule of the Lord is to be trusted, it gives wisdom to the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, they gladden the heart. The command of the Lord is clear, it gives light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is holy, abiding forever. The decrees of the Lord are truth, and all of them just. They are more to be desired than gold, than the purest of gold. And sweeter are they than honey, than honey from the comb. So in them your servant finds instruction. Great reward is in their keeping. But who can detect all his errors? From hidden faults acquit me. From presumption restrain your servant. Let it not rule me. Then shall I be blameless, clean from grave sin. May the spoken words of my mouth, the thoughts of my heart, win favor in your sight, O Lord, my rescuer, my rock. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, mother of God, Pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death, amen. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end, amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen.